Thank you for joining us today. Just a very few quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. The session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Olivier Califf. Thank you and take it away, Olivier. Hello to all of you virtual attendees. So I'm Olivier Califf and I'll be moderating this session. I'm a first liaison and I'm working for Sanofi a Healthcare Company. And I was part of the 2020 program conference committee. Uh, as you might be used to, you've got a question and answer um, button at the bottom so uh, of the screen, so don't hesitate to, uh, to ask uh, questions. And with that, let's go and introduce the, the presentations by two speakers today. So Letitia Kamp-Schmidt, who is an incident handler at the uh, incident handler at St. Boone, uh, which is part of BSI. Uh, she graduated in 2017 from the Vienna University and worked as a cybersecurity researcher in an Austrian research center, and then as a freelance software in the field of industrial IoT, and now at Sudbund. And I'm also very happy to introduce Michael Dusset as the second presenter. I had the pleasure to work with him for uh, something like five years. Uh, he graduated in 28, um, um, then joined BSI, and more specifically, Third Boons uh, as an incident responder, then incident manager. Uh, he is the first representative for Third Boons and a regular uh, first conference attendee and other international meetings. Uh, since uh, last year, he's been heading the, the mobile incident response team, the MIRT at the BSI, which is a dedicated team with uh, senior incident responder experts that can rapidly be deployed on site during major incidents. So having said that, Letitia and uh, Michael, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll share my screen. So it should be up, right? Yeah. Okay, so we are happy to introduce to you i 2 Help, Canadian maple syrup, French fries, and German sausages, or what we call cyber potluck parties or lessons learned from cross-border incident handling. So some of you might have already asked yourself what i 2 Help means. It's the acronym for International Incident Handling Operating Procedure. And with that, we'll actually dive into our presentation. So um, Olivia already made our quick introduction, so no longer on this, but just a short introduction again. Uh, I'm an incident handler uh, manager at CERT Bund, which is part of the BSI. And with that, I give to my colleague, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Wusset. As Olivia introduced me uh, as the head of the CERT Bund Mobile Incident Response Team, I'm still the acting head of that team but I'm um, also now the head of the CERP and Incident Response and Liaison Officer of the National Cyber Response Center. And with that, uh, I'm proud that I now uh, can present you the, the menu of today. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, we have a three course menu for you today. We have uh, the minced real world case story as an appetizer, the story which uh, led to the paper, which was one of the reasons why we wrote that paper. Then Letizia, as the main author of the paper will present you the five phases we have identified when you do incident international uh, incident handling. And to complement uh, our menu, we will speak about dealing with classified information when doing international incident response. Next slide, please. So for the uh, ransomware case, we had, or there was one ransomware case just called in country X. Uh, there was a uh, a law uh, a criminal case investigation ongoing for law enforcement, which had access to a C2 server uh, of a ransomware group and the extracted data for uh, yeah for victims. And but it was uh, too much data, so they asked National Search for help, and the National Search did a one-time effort to extract all the data and uh, send it out to all the other National Certs. And we received the data, notified our victims. And as this was a one-time effort, but uh, as this was ongoing, they keep more and more victims appearing on that server each and every day. 
So the national sort asked for help because they couldn't do it alone, sent out all the victim notification. Next, please. So they invited uh, other national sorts for hackathon to work on that data because uh, the police was insisting that as this was an ongoing case, all the raw data had to stay inside the country borders. So it was not allowed to, to leave the country. So we went on site uh, with our forensic experts. Next slide, please. And learned a lot on this case. So the first thing when we arrived was uh, we were asked, oh, good, uh, the Germans are here. We are a little sparse on incident managers. Would you mind uh, coordinating the hackathon? Yeah, of course, we are Germans. We love organizing stuff, but if we had known in advance, we would have uh, brought our own instant managers and not only our black hoodie uh, forensic analysis. So this was the first thing. Then we learned, yeah, you could overcome bureaucratic regulations. It needs a lot of talk with the police, some maybe some NDAs and some trust building. But afterwards, the police was able or allowing uh, us to, to receive the, the raw data also in our country. So they were able to share data outside and we could then uh, do the work from our home office. And But what we then saw is that when every team after Hackathon went home, they, uh, yeah, they kept working on their own. Um, the sharing declined and also there was a lot of duplicate work done. So a lot of scripts were wrote by many teams on their own and shared afterwards just to learn that, yeah, this is just what the others wrote too. Then it was also not clear about the outcome. What was the real goal of this effort? Because it was running for months and for months, uh, this case. And at some time we had to decide uh, when we have to pull back our resources to have them for our own cases and just do the minimal effort to yeah, work on that case from this other country. Next, uh, yeah, next please. And one thing of, of course we learned is now we're preparing for the worst case when going on site also with our MERT team. And, but this was just as I call it a small ransomware case, but with many victims, but it was a small case. Now imagine you have um, in this Corona time, a large, uh, pharmaceutical company, a multinational company, which has its HQ in country A and its uh, production in country B, and they have a compromise. So it may be even a critical infrastructure in your country. So you start keep uh, the, the, the incident, the work, and of course the national third gets involved, the police gets involved. If it's an APT, you have your intelligence services uh, on board and all the other parties like consultants and incident responders, the service providers, which are all on that case. And this is just in your country. Now, if you have to uh, work with the parties uh, on the other side of the river in the other country, it gets more and more complicated. And what we learned, next please, is that uh, it's not like a linear function when you get more and more players and more and more nations, but the complexity is more some kind of an exponential curve. Uh, with dealing all the different laws, languages, expectations, and also different cultures when working together. And yeah, we decided to uh, write a paper to, to write the most important things down. You have to think about when working with international partners on international case. And now for the main course, Letitia, Letitia will now tell you about uh, the five phases we identified. Yes, thank you, Michael. So before I go into more depth, I want to emphasize that the I2HOP concept is not meant to be a prescriptive standard that needs to be strictly followed, but it is more meant to be um, an open framework that can be worked on and can be adapted however you need it for your purposes. What we wanted to do and what our aim was to write a paper that you can just easily pull out in case a cross-border incident happens. So you have all the checklists in there, you know all the important things to think about, you can read about potential hazard, potential frictions and tensions that can happen, and maybe even problems that you have never thought about before, but they have happened. And we just tried to comprehensively write it all into one nice framework that you can use anytime. So without further ado, going on to the five phases. It begins all of the planning and preparation. 
And let's say it all begins with a national incident. It can be really a quite small incident at the beginning, but as you know, it happens quite often with incidents, they grow bigger quite fast, um, supposedly Friday afternoon. And then at some point you have to pull in more national players. Let's think about, for example, intelligence agencies, the national CERT, police, law enforcement, could be also many more as we have seen on the slide before. And then at some point while you're working together, you notice, okay, we do need uh, to interact with other partners um, on, in other countries because this incident affects parties in other countries. So at this point, several questions arise, starting with why does this case require international engagement? Is it maybe because you found potential victims abroad or is it because the command and control server of the attackers is located in a different country and you need the help of the law enforcement or is it just really something minor? So at the beginning, before you dive deep into this whole incident, cross-border incident handling process, you should always consider is just an email or a phone call enough or do we need to start this whole process and um, engage so many people in this next question would be sorry <laughs> next question would be is are we willing to work cooperatively on the case and does every national player agree with this step so sometimes if you think about law enforcement or intelligence agencies they are not so keen on working with their counterparts in certain other countries so it is important that if you as a CERT are the key player in this uh, scenario to act as a facilitator and to um, you know, get everybody on board, keep in mind that not every party is equally affected anyways. So maybe you don't need the counterpart for every single party, but just you know, the other CERT of another country. But just make clear to communicate this openly so everybody knows who will be on board and that everybody agrees on this cooperation. And finally, at what TLP or secrecy level can we cooperate? Most of you probably already know the TLP protocol and use it quite often. It is also the preferred choice because it, you can, with this, you can easily determine which data can be processed by whom and which information can be shared with whom. But always, if you're in doubt, consult with your legal department beforehand and also consider special arrangements if the case is under governmental secrecy restrictions. So once these questions have all been answered and you're still sure that yes, you need the whole incident handling process and not just a quick phone call, this is where a transition from a national to an international cross-border case happens, or as we call it figuratively within this presentation, the potluck is starting. So this means that several other parties from different nations will join in. And um, now you have to ask yourself, are there already established contacts? Because we've all been here, right? Having the awkward silence moment with people you have never talked to before. And all of a sudden you're supposed to work on a teamwork together. So this is more basically a plea to think about this beforehand to join certain um, international sharing groups, for example, EGC or IWUN, where you share information on a regular basis, where you meet, like even if it's virtually in times of Corona or different, by the way, you just know the faces where you know who to contact, you have spoken with the people beforehand. And so having this level of trust makes working together so much easier. Next question would be, who are the involved parties? So this should be quite clear to everybody who's involved because this can actually lead to several different problems on really different levels. Thinking about, for example, if a a crime incident and law enforcement is involved. This could lead to heavy bureaucratic regulations that are very time consuming and that you should consider way ahead. It could also be the case that several different IT security service providers are involved in the case. So this could lead to competitive tensions, for example. Or if you think about it, if a ministry or maybe even a very important person is involved in the case, it could trigger public att attention that needs special handling as well. So there are so many points to consider with this that it should be openly communicated right in the beginning who you think will be involved in this case. And then always keep in mind that the more parties are involved in the case, the more complex and challenging it gets, as Michael presented before. 
And then finally, the last question within this phase, what are the objectives and expectations of the all involved parties? And this is probably the question of the phase because it is also the question that triggers the most tensions and that leads to the biggest stress and problems within the team. So it is very important to openly communicate this right from the beginning so that everybody who's involved knows what to expect. So the initiating team should at least vaguely predict how many human resources it requires, with which skills and for how long, and to stay realistic with these expectations. And the other involved parties, they should keep in mind that they shouldn't make any promises that they can't keep. And they should also consider when joining that there still might arise national incidents and that they might have a higher priority. So it is important that the initiating team clearly states their expectations at the beginning, because if this is what they expect and they don't communicate this very clearly, maybe this might be the outcome. As we have also heard in the ransomware case at the beginning, there, the expectations weren't really clearly communicated. So the wrong people were there and they couldn't bring the outcome that was desired. So moving on to phase three, the implementation of the required setup. Now that all those first questions have been answered and dealt with, now it's uh, important to get everybody on board so everybody's really prepared for this case. So for this, we first have to think about a case pseudonym so we can communicate in an easy way, even if we don't have always a secure line. If we have a case pseudonym that doesn't, um, uh, that is not indicative of the real incident or company name, it is much more easy to communicate openly with your team partners. The next question is the language of choice in this case. It might sound trivial, but if you work then on reports, for example, for your national authorities, and you write them in your mother language, and then you have to translate them afterwards again to share with your partners, it's so much more work. So it's much easier to just agree on this in the beginning and say, okay, we will write everything in English, for example, and then you don't have to do this extra work afterwards again. The next question will be, with how many people are the different parties involved? So it is quite important to consider the team sizes because the number of participants of each involved party should be in a realistic proportion to the total team size, of course. So if the entire team is usually only five people, you cannot expect that all five of them will be in this international incident as well. So stay realistic with those expectations. And then in general, a too large team exacerbates coordination and cooperation, but also a too small team is, means too much teamwork, uh, too much work for every individual in that team. So keep that in mind when planning how many people from each team will be in this teamwork together. And finally, how and when can the different parties or persons be reached? This is actually also Sounds quite trivial, but then you run into those problems, for example, talking about bank holidays. So a lot of you who are not German probably have no idea about the bank holidays in Germany and when they are. Vice versa, I have no clue about bank holidays in other countries. And then the situations happen that you have something really important that you want to share right now, and then nobody's reachable and you have no clue why. And then this causes just unnecessary stress and frustration. And it would be so much easier to just, you know, share maybe a team calendar with your teammates to just let them know if you have a, a planned vacation, if you have a planned absence, or if there's a bank holiday in your country. So you can just take away this potential problem if it just beforehand. And um, talking about planned vacation, etc., it's also important that at least the most important roles always appoint at least one deputy. So if one person also leaves not planned, for example, being sick, you at least have one other counterpart that can still, you know, take the information that you can still reach, that you can still talk about. And just to give the other team the, the feeling of, yes, they are still in here and not at all. It's all about this one person. And if that person is gone, nobody can be reached anymore. So then... As we, have, or as we have been already talking about the people involved and how we can reach them, it is also the question who is responsible for what. It has been proven to be quite uh, handy to define 
at least three roles in each incident, which is the incident manager, the technical lead, and the person in charge of, of, charge of threat intelligence. It might be that actually one person um, takes all three roles, but you should still at least define them because they have different responsibilities. And having this role, you also have a different view on the whole topic or case. And finally, what kind of infrastructure and technical setup is required? So to keep everything up and running and also to show the people that you what you're working on, it's much easier to have a collaborative case documentation and to also have a shared co cooperative working space, which could be a wiki or a Metamouse chat or audio video conferencing tools, et cetera, et cetera. But then it is also important that you have enough local storage. And then a really important point is to have a, a, at least <laughs> a moderately fast uh, possibility for file exchange, because this can um, cause such a delay if a team is waiting forever to get the data downloaded if they don't have a reasonable way to exchange files with each other. So, um, what we've also thought about, what would be might helpful is version management, log management, and then really trivial things like think about a stable Wi-Fi network or encryption methods if you're, um, for example, on site. And so we have uh, created an entire checklist with all the things we thought about when it comes to the infrastructure and technical setup, and you can read about that in the paper. So now that everybody's on board, Right? We want to keep the workflow going. So with this, the question is who will do what and how can a continuous workflow be achieved? As I already mentioned with the team planner, besides the calendar, we want to have a task planner and tracker. So we kind of know what is still a to do, for what are we still waiting, uh, what has to be done. And to keep control over this, this would be some of one of the tasks that the incident manager should regularly check on. And to keep the workflow continuously, it is really important to continuously share your results. This is also where the shared workplace comes in handy because then you can easily see this. It's also helpful to give the other teams, you know, a non-secure heads up, maybe in a chat. It doesn't have to uh, include any information. It's enough to ping, there is new information, and then the person can then look it up. But just to keep this workflow going, just to keep the communication going, even though you might be in really different places right now. So it is also important to react and to always, uh, you know, let the other one know, yes, you're still on, uh, on board. Uh, what also helps is to have regular conference calls and um, to also differentiate between a status and a technical call, because then it is very targeted towards the, the persons that are, are in charge of this because maybe a managerial call is not very interesting for the techies and, and vice versa. And so you might want to differentiate this so nobody's actually bored during those um, conference calls. And um, also quite important is to really openly and timely communicate if there is any other business, maybe a national case that might interfere because if you just drop out without telling the others, this is really a big uh, cause of frustration. And just to communicate, communicate this openly makes it so much easier to plan and then to also plan how the team can get back on board. So we do have some more uh, questions. Is that a five minute? Five minutes remaining. Okay, great. We will, we will make that. <laughs> um, so the question is, what kind of documentation and reports are we required? Um, I'll make it a bit faster right now. So maybe the important point is that you want to do this right away because it's made way more cumbersome to do it at the end and to remember everything that happened. And also if law enforcement is involved, it might be required for evidence collection to have a gap less timeline. Also consider any potential legal impediments, especially for example, in the light of the GDPR um, so always keep the data protection officer informed and uh, involved. Finally, what are potential cultural differences and maybe personal issues? 
So I already mentioned a lot of them throughout the uh, entire presentation. And um, so the incident manager is probably the person, the key person in this case, who um, you should always use as a mediator to act uh, in, in cases of personal frictions or cultural frictions. And to even be better in this task, it might be handy to send the, in, the incident managers to intercultural competence training, because then they are even better prepared for cases like this. And finally, how is the media involved in the case? This is basically just a plea that the involved teams should align their media strategy, because it's not very good if one team, for example, um, spoils everything to the media, why, whereas the other team in the other country is completely closed about giving information out. So just align this in one way so you can um, all follow the same media strategy. So this brings us to phase five, the remediation and closure of the case. This is, you know, the cleanup after the party. It's not the most popular part. Everybody also already wants to go home, basically but it also great, adds great value. So um, we want to talk about the outcome of the case. This is uh, something that Michael um, already mentioned at the beginning. It was re really unclear in this case. So just make sure that you know what you want at the end. So maybe, for example, a shared final report or any other kind of outcome. Think of how you can improve on the case. Don't do any finger pointing or bashing, but try to really learn and critically reflect on the case and try to find a structured plan for implementing the suggestions. And maybe also share what you've learned with other teams so they can learn from your best practices. And talking about sharing, finally, information sharing with other um, not involved third parties, for example, in trusted communities. Just make sure to find an agreement upon the scope and level of detail if you have to anonymize the data and maybe also the TLP level, what you can share and with whom. So this brings us to the actual final point, the extra Wurst, which is the German term for just a little bit extra. And I won't go into really much detail here. Um, it is an attachment of our document and it's just a very special case if the you know, TLP protocol, et cetera, is just not enough and gives you a lot of hints on what to consider if you have this special case. So with this, this brings me to my final slide. This is the i 2 hope paper. It will be publicly available soon as a TLP-wide version. It is already available on request. And talking about all the food, please do not confuse our i 2 hope paper with the International House of Pancakes or IHOP. This is not a commercial. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leticia and, and Michael. Two quick questions uh, for in uh, one minute each at most. Have you applied the uh, the model to real case already? And what were the experience? And that's a question from Kauto. Yeah, Michael, we have not, you... yeah, yeah, we have not really uh, applied it in the whole to our international cases. Of course, some of the aspects are what are in there. We, we try to already uh, follow when we are working with other teams but we plan when we now have large uh, international cases to apply this model and maybe at the next uh, uh, conference or when we met i can uh, talk about how it's worked out okay. i think it was also a bit because of corona that we didn't actually go other places this year so much where we could apply it fully and another question from an anonymous uh, attendee uh, who is uh, working in a multi-vendor multi based in the US and who's been involved in uh, cross country incidents. And he struggled on how to engage with the right international resources, especially when he wasn't the, uh, the actual victim. So how does your international coordination factor uh, in multinational concerns when you, these are not countries? Do you have any experience on that or any intent to extend your model? Uh, so if it's, if it's basically one company that has subsidiaries in different countries, did I get that right? Yeah. We actually do consider that in our paper. It, it is basically a bit different towards uh, what we just presented, but um, we, we already considered it um, that it's one case where you have different companies or um, you know, governmental 
institutions, but also the case where we have one like headquarter and then a subsidiary in a different country. And we do mention that in a case study um, that is also an attachment of the document. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Letizia and Mako, for uh, this presentation. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get this uh, paper in advance uh, while preparing, and I really uh, recommend the attendees to ask for it. It's a really great paper, worth reading, and has two great uh, case studies. Uh, that said, the session is now over. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, please uh, log off this session and uh, reconnect to the next one and final one for the day. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.